Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Greetings. This is Hugh Ballou. Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange yet again. What a great time we have with amazing people who have amazing things to share. And for a long time, um, I have worked with 32 plus years with clergy and nonprofit leaders. And I have often thought, well, they have a really good message. What if they worked on their presentation skills? So we are presenting to people who could be on our board, could be on our teams, our committees, could write us a check, but we sometimes don't come across very well. So my guest today, uh, Rich Bontrager, he goes by the nickname Trigger. And of course we have a lot of fun with that. Um, Rich is um, not far from Lynchburg. He's over on the other side um, of Virginia, just at, in Washington, DC. So Rich, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange and tell people a little bit about yourself, would you please? Yeah, th- thanks you for having me on. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, Trigger is a nickname. I'll explain that in a few minutes. I'm, it is a fun nickname to have. Um, but I've been a broadcaster for over 30 years. I've also been in church ministry for about 25 years. So I've worked with nonprofits, ministry outlets as well. Um, and I have been a public speaker, broadcaster on, on the physical stage from the church pulpit and in the broadcast studio. So I've always had a microphone. And so I've always learned skills of presentation, communication, and now with the advent of COVID shutdown, the, the birth of the virtual stage is now here. And so I have all these skills and I brought them together like a new sandwich. Uh, I've got broadcasting, public speaking, and let's bring them together and let's help people do better on these virtual outlets, what I call virtual stages. Your camera presence, your uh, annunciation, your hand gestures, your backdrops, all the things that are TV and broadcast skills, I've learned this for over 25, almost 30 years. Now we have to learn it, regardless of your industry, you have to learn broadcast skills to better share your message and make an impact. So that's kind of me. Um, I have a great family. I've had a great life and I love to do this, Hugh. Uh, This is now my new passion to, to, to give back when I've learned and to help other people actually rock the virtual stage. Amazing, amazing. Um, I was talking to a mutual friend of ours uh, yesterday who's going to be celebrating her 90th birthday in just over a week. And um, we had talked about various careers and I had shared I'm in my third career and um, having the best time doing great things with great people. And, you know, in our network with the Center Vision Network, we have people that are doing some incredible stuff, making a difference in the lives of people and a difference that matters. Um, so you've been in the pulpit. Now, you're also a member of the National Speakers Association, and I, I assume you've clocked a lot of hours to be able to be a member of that association. Um, there's some very skill sets with being a presenter. Now, I, um, I flipped over from being a conductor to a presenter. That means I had to turn around and face people instead of turning my back to them. In um, May of 2007, I was on a big stage with a whole lot of people. And um, it's different. It's very different. I, I will say to you, um, conducting choir and orchestra is a lot more difficult than it is speaking. But having to face people is a whole different skill set. Mm-hmm. And so I've studied content with a speaking coach and I've studied with a drama coach how to present myself on stage. So what are the specific skills? We're going to talk about your title is the five, five tips for rocking the virtual stage. I'm going to give you a chance to list those, but um, what specific, uh, you've had that background that you mentioned in, in all those different areas. So what are the specific skill sets that you bring to the table to help nonprofit leaders and clergy be better at presenting their message? Well, like you said, I've clocked over a, a thousand different stages, at least I've been on. And I've been in, again, from the public to the professional, to the entertainment sector. I have been in the ministry sector. So the crowds are always changing. The goal in almost every one of those, Hugh, the overlapping goal is education of some kind. We're trying to educate. We're trying to share knowledge, inform people of something. 
And so the tools are very simple, very similar, but they're also a little bit different depending on which people you're trying to reach. Uh, the verbiage may change, but many of the skill sets are the same. And now, as I mentioned earlier, this is now broadcast TV. I've met with a lot of well-known speakers uh, that have been on stage, but now this is TV. Uh, this is changing where, where you put your hands, how you talk, where you look at. Um, and like you said, turning around from your back to the stage to the front of the stage, there's no crowd in front of us anymore, Hugh. We're all in rooms by ourselves trying to figure out how to be entertaining and engaging. Uh, and a lot of what we do now has to be a mental adjustment. So one of the first things is there's, it's got to be a mental conversation here to talk about those five things. You almost have to imagine your audience, don't you? You do. No, that is actually the precursor to everything else I'm going to talk about today is you have to have imagination. Now, I've been gifted with a great um, great imagination. I love Walt Disney. I love cartoons. I love. So for me, it was very easy. Plus, I had to overcome a stutter when I was young. So I was always imagining playing to a crowd, playing to different things. Um, I, I know a gentleman that had a real struggle with this who took his kids Pixar toys. So he was talking to Buzz Lightyear when this whole thing began with COVID and he created an audience. So I, I really encourage people, put pictures on the other side of the camera, put your wife, put your loved one, put a fake audience, cardboard cutouts, whatever you can do to begin to imagine you're not in a room by yourself, begin to turn the camera into a person, fall in love with the camera and begin to realize now you're engaging people. It will come through the lens. If you have a hard time with that adjustment, this is really going to be really tough because you are playing to an empty room. Everyone right now is doing it, but the best people have to learn to turn on their imagination and see people smiling and laughing and having a good time with you. Well, in some of the stages we've been on, um, there's lights and you really can't see your audience, but, but there's a presence there and people, yeah. there's, there's people respond to what you're saying. So um, there's no comparison now to what we used to have when there was a, a live audience. Before we go to your your five tips, let's tell us about this trigger thing. <laughs> okay, so Bond Trigger, when you're doing sports play by play and doing interview shows on on the radio, which I spent a lot of my career, you get caught up in the excitement, the energy, and Bond Trigger usually gets cut, misheard, misspelled. Uh, it's been butchered so many times, Hugh. So Trigger is part of my personality. Um, I was with the same. Uh, sports partner for seven years, three different stations we went to, had a talk show, and he was more of this straight guy. He would give the facts, the stats, and I just had that personality. The phone lines light up. I would take the same information and twist it a little bit to get people to call in and say, that's wrong. You're an idiot, or let me debate you because your opinion is really whacked out, Bond Trigger, and Trigger became the personality of I would just have that little skew that little bent a little bit differently and it got people more engaged and more exciting and then the the personality that i'm very outgoing very energetic it just added to it and for 30 years now trigger has been around and since since we're in a new world of branding and marketing i can't come up with a better brand marketing tool than my own nickname so trigger it is trigger it is and so trigger is a noun and trigger is a verb <laughs> now you're getting deep. Now <laughs> All right. The suspense is building. You got these five tips. What are they? So let me give you the five real quickly, and then we're going to break them down a little bit here as we go through it. But it's energy, engagement, entertainment, environment, and education. Those are the five. And I also break them down in order. There's a reason they're in that order, because education is where we all want to get to some sort of product, sales, biblical teaching, whatever it is we're involved in, we are at an education overall. But if you don't do the first four well, they're not going to stick around to get to number five. So you do have to do them in a certain order. All right. Number one, education. Uh, no, we're, we're going to save education for last. We're going to do energy first. So we're going to build the pyramid up and energy is number one. You were talking about this idea of we're in rooms by ourselves. This is now exhausting, Hugh. People have a tough time playing to an empty room. Like you said, we don't have the emotion of the crowd. We don't have the applause. We don't have that energy that fills when, when, when you're on stage. We all got used to walking on stage. The introduction was given. And we'd go, woo, thanks for letting me be here today. Great time. And the energy would just 
flow out and we would hit the mark and light it up. You're now in a room by yourself. It's me, myself, and I trying to make an engaging, fun time. So the energy we have to exude now, you have to be so intentional and so extra pumped up for the camera that it takes more out of you. And more and more people are finding out a long webinar, a long coaching session, a long church sermon, whatever it is you're doing, this takes a lot more out of you because it's just you doing all the hard work with your energy. So I'm curious, are you standing? Yes, I'm standing. Uh, and that's intentional. Standing is part of the way to get energy. You're standing because this is part of presentation. We, we, we've been trained this way to get on stage. And to me, this is a real stage. Uh, part of that mental adjustment, Hugh, is this is not a small thing. The virtual stage is ever expanding. It is something bigger and bigger. So bring the bigness of the full stage. Present like you're on the grand stage and bring the energy, bring the passion, and let's have a great show. Well, you know, for, for 40 years, I was in church music ministry and teaching singers posture and all that that goes with vocal production um, is important and the, and the warm up to that. So there's, there's a preface to creating the energy. It's not only mental, it's physical, right? Yes. So before every show that I do, and I, I have my own weekly talk show that I do a whole webinar TV show. For, before everything, I'll actually turn on music with you and I will use that as an energizer bunny. I get jacked up before every show. I turn it to 12. I crank out some of my favorite songs. I've got some go-tos. It gets the energy, the blood boiling. I have a good time rocking backstage in my own green room. And then I come on stage and I'm ready to go for you. And I encourage people to do that. Find a way to get the fuse lit before you go on camera. Even my audio podcast, when I switch from being seated at a desk and doing my script to standing, you could hear the difference. I have coached people that, again, professional speakers for years and years, they've sat down, they're doing the desktop conversation, and they're wondering why it's lagging, they're wondering why they're not feeling it, why the crowd's not feeling it. In my coaching sessions, I tell them, stand up. And, they, and they're like, this is stupid. No, no, come on, stand up. And we just keep coaching and talking. And in the middle of every one, someone says, what just happened? And I said, what happened was you're back on stage. You're feeling the energy. You're getting back into full body language. 70% of what we communicate is through body language. So when we start presenting again, we're talking a whole new language again. And even the speaker and the audience feels that language in a whole new way. So speakers have forgotten it. Now let's talk about churches, pastors, CEO, nonprofit organizations. This is a whole new skill set to learn. You need to stand up, have new energy to go to where you want to go. Love it. So energy is front and center. What's number two? That's going to be the engagement side. Now, engagement is, and we talked about this on the, on the physical stage, there's a glass between you and the live audience. You have to figure out always on the physical stage how to break the glass. What do you need to do to engage them and bring them with you on a journey, on an adventure? When I was in church ministry, I did not talk about doing a sermon. I talked about giving an experience. How can I engage your heart, your mind, your soul, everything? How can I engage you? CEOs, the same way. What can we do? So the engagement now is the poll questions. You can use polls. You can use chat boxes. You can use breakout rooms. You can do different things to raise engagement virtually get people together in small groups. So you can still do your big presentation, smaller presentation and breakout rooms, and you can change the rhythm with these different engagement tools. The, the opportunities are endless right now if you start learning how to do it, but engagement is key because they will turn out. If you don't have the energy like TV, they'll turn the channel someplace else. You know, um, what I determine in speaking in front of large audiences, the bigger they are, the faster they'll turn on you. So the uh, engagement piece is key. Yes, and there's lots of new things you can learn to do. So we're also in the TV age, and we're going to talk about entertainment later on, but we, we, we've been trained by TV of seven minutes as a TV commercial. Bathroom break, snack break, some new information, something's going on. Part of engagement now is, as we present virtually, how can we bring those same things in to engage our audience? So you don't go for 30 minutes 
an hour straight through. No one's going to stay with you. What can you do to change the rhythm every seven to 10 minutes? Send them to a, a poll question here. Get them to click. Ask a question. Get them in the chat box. Take their personal question through the chat box. Tell them, hey, you know what? I'm going to throw this question out to everybody, and I'm going to give you 15 minutes in a breakout room. Drop people in the breakout rooms. Have them come back and they say, now, breakout room A, what did you learn? Breakout room two. Now you're raising engagement. It's not just you. It's everyone in the audience totally engaging. Their energy goes up. Their desire to stay with you goes up, and you get people to stay with you longer and longer. But again, you've got to now think about this as show running, event running, a whole different way. And I don't care what you're presenting. It's still the common denominator. We're, um, we're in this, um, I guess I would call it a TV culture. Even before the COVID, we're in a group and people right in front of you will be talking to each other. They're treating you like you're a TV because TV is so boring. They have a sad conversation going on. So what you're talking about becomes even more critical when you're presenting to people you can't even see out there. Right. And so we've all had the Zoom fatigue or whatever platform you're on. We've all had the tiny little Brady Bunch boxes. You, you, you can't read the crowd. You don't know if they're laughing. You don't know if they're playing on their cell phones or talking to their kids off camera, if they're eating pizza when they turn the camera off. You don't know what's really going on. The physical stage, you could read the room. You could hear. You could see the guy reach for his pen. You could see the guy flip out his phone and text his wife. There's so many things you could see back then. It's now you have to hold them deeper, longer, because you really don't know what's going on the other side of the lens. So it, again, this is more energy, more thought, more engagement, but also make it fun. Make it a lot of fun to be engaging because people, again, are craving human connection right now, Hugh. They want to have people connect with them and be engaging with them. And for many people, this box is the only way they're doing it. So what can we do as ministers, as thought leaders, as nonprofits, how can we better serve the people we want to serve by creating more engagement opportunities, have parties, have theme parties, have, have birthday parties, have whatever you need to do to create more engagement with your people. Now I participate in a sign up for webinars, not because I'm interested in the topic, but I'm interested in how they get people there. And then what do they do during the presentation? And some of these are hour, hour and a half, two hour events. But I look at how do they keep people engaged? So there's some hokey things like, yeah, put in a yes in there, or put in a go hue, or put in something that's silly. What are some of your, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a response piece, an audience response piece. And I guess you break that, that glass barrier on the uh, Zoom as well as you do in person. So what are some of the techniques you use? Well, well, when I'm running a group, for example, well, we'll do different theme days. So you can rename yourself up in the upper right-hand corner. You go hit these dots on the Zoom box. You can rename yourself. So I've done like tonight, let's all do our favorite cartoon characters. I've had rooms where now it's Batman, it's Superman, it's Daffy Duck, it's Mickey Mouse. And the fun thing is you're also learning the personality of the person. They'll pick that and it tells you something about them without even telling you something about them. So now you can talk, hey, Daffy Duck, what do you think of this? Turn on your mic for a second, Daffy. And you have a whole new personality, a whole new engagement going on with people. And everyone else can see, especially if you're working with a company that everyone knows each other. Well, everyone just learned a whole lot about each other by simply changing their name. You can put your email addresses in there. People now can do that. Drop in your LinkedIn address. If you want to make a connection with people, everyone put your LinkedIn address in. And then you can say, you know what? I want to get to know Hugh. I'm going to go to his LinkedIn spot. I'm going to go click, do a connection right now. Now you're taking the engagement from here to another engagement offline where you ultimately want to get them is offline. Um, you can do theme parties. I I've, uh, grew up with a bunch of friends in high school and we used to do bonfires all together. So we did a virtual bonfire recently. I, I, I had a bonfire pit burning in the background on my screen. We all got together. We had a, a pizza and food and everyone had their own stuff. And we start regaling old stories. Well, one guy brings a bunch of pictures and we start screen sharing pictures of us when our teenage years engagement really hot we had a blast laughing and telling stories and it was a blast that's the way engagement goes by coming up with new creative ways to pull people in with you love it love it love it so um 
we've got, I was looking at my list here. Um, what's number three? Entertainment. And Ooh. now for many people in the nonprofit sector, yeah, that, that's usually the reaction right there, Hugh. That's usually the reaction for, for ministry people, for church people, like this is a dirty word. We don't want to do it. And like you referenced earlier, we are now in the TV age. We are now in the age where medium, media, social media, everything is wired for sound and wired for entertainment. If you do not have an entertainment element, and I don't mean goofy, I don't mean like silly whack out. I'm talking if you are not engaging, entertaining, you are going to lose people. You need to find ways to have this come to life. Um, storytelling is one of the best ways in the world. During your presentations, tell a compelling story. Put the sights, the sound, the smell, the taste into your stories. Take them on a journey with you. Entertain them with something that also has value to the greater meaning of what you're talking about. Um, think of Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was one of the best talk show hosts ever. He was entertaining. He would storytell. He would always break the glass. He was inside the cube. He was inside a TV box all of his life, and he had a magical way of entertaining people through the camera lens. So you have to now figure out what's your style and how are you gonna bring laughter and entertainment into all this? I love it, I love it. You know, um, I when I teach live events, uh, whether they're virtual or in person, um, there's there's gotta be a, or, or if I'm doing a, a serious event like strategic planning, there's got to be in all these elements, but the entertainment part, I do believe people learn more when they're having fun. I don't care if you're in church, you can laugh in church. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and you, you, you need to make it something that the heart feels entertainment, you know, even comedians, the best comedians are the ones that they're telling you a reality about life, but it's really funny because everyone can relate to it. Everyone knows that's, I mean, Jeff Foxworthy, so funny by the Southern jokes. I lived in Georgia for three years. The reason those jokes are so good, he's not telling a joke. He's telling the truth with a little bit of humor thrown in. And that's where entertainment comes into this. The, uh, the other thing, and, and, you, and you kind of reference it, is we now live in a soundbite culture. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever media you are connected to, Facebook, we are now into a soundbite culture. You need to figure out how to grab people, have a headline, have a catchphrase, have a teaser. And how are you going to do that in a compelling way that they're going to want to go click and stay with you for the next 45 minutes, 35 minutes? The soundbite culture, it's not made for a long, draw, dried out dissertation. It's got to be bang. How do you grab them? So how to rock the virtual stage for nonprofits? How to rock the virtual stage for churches? What are you going to say or do to get that quick little hashtag type thing and get the short capture and pull them in and make it fun and entertaining? We have to learn these skills. It's um, what's evident here, but we haven't said it yet, is it's a two way engagement is two ways. Um, it's, it's not just us pushing stuff out. It, there's a receiving side. It's, it's sort of the fundamental of uh, communication. There's a, there's a sending and a receiving. There's an understanding, there's an accepting. So there's a lot of pieces to how we relate to people. And so I guess breaking that, that, um, that barrier with the glass is beginning to create a relationship with your audience. So um, let me go back to the engagement piece a minute. Um, yeah. We have to engage them for them to be entertained. And, and if we're boring, they're not gonna be engaged. So speak to a minute about scripts and um, lecterns. You know, oh I'm, yeah, I'm one a, of my favorites. <laughs> I'm a specific guy. We're in a, an age where the media criticize everybody for their word choices, and they themselves use bad word choices. You know, podium, a conductor stands on a podium. You don't stand on a lectern, but they call a lectern a podium, and then they criticize everybody else. But that is a barrier in itself, isn't it? In church, it's the pulpit, and in, on, you know, in, in a lecture hall, it's the lectern. So that's a barrier in itself, isn't it? That's a great point. Uh, and so in my church ministry stay, uh, days, 99.9% .9 of the time, I pushed the lectern off. I pushed the podium off. Even if I was visiting a church and doing a, a guest speaker, I would tell them in advance, I'm going to open up the stage. I want to take all the barriers between me and them and 
clean it away. That, again, that's why I stand up during my virtual events. I am doing a full presentation. I'm trying to clean all the things out. The desk that we sit out, sit at, even though we're a virtual, is a new barrier. People know you're sitting. They know you're in an office space. Here, this is expansive. This is open. So the more open you are, the better it's going to be. So even though we're doing virtual church, we're doing virtual uh, life groups, Bible studies, whatever, whatever it is we're doing, I encourage you to open it up. Maybe sit at a couch, but don't have anything in front of you. Stand up and, wor and work the whole stage and learn how to have a camera following you and things like that. But it is a different form of engagement. Yeah, but remove those obstacles. Remove anything that acts as a barrier. Um, you can have a distracting plant behind you. You can have your dog behind you. Uh, how many people have we seen have their laundry <laughs> or their wardrobe in the background during a big event? That's distracting. That takes away from the engagement or too many books in your bookshelf. People are not listening to you, Hugh. They're trying to figure out what you're reading. What's your favorite books in your bookshelf? You can have that, but if you overdo it, the engagement shifts from you to that other thing and you want the engagement to be here. So what can you do to take that lectern or whatever thing it is, whatever that barrier is, move it out of the way and keep the engagement right here. I had a journey my first public speaking, you know, having to turn around and face an audience, you know, there's a fear factor. What, what's next on my script? So um, I was having a conversation just yesterday with a family member who's clergy and their church here in Charlotte, where I am today, um, is really doing some innovative things virtually with people. And um, he's one of many of the clergy staff, but he said he's gone away from scripting and he, first he read his scripts, then you memorize the scripts, but people still know you're reading it off your eyelids so that the script itself is a barrier. So you'll laugh at this. When I first did keynotes, um, I, I would lean on the slides. There was a monitor in front of me so I could see my own slides. But you know, I, I hate it when, I, when I'm at a group and if somebody comes and they present and they got all these slides with too many words and they turn around and read them with their back to you. You know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're guilty of that with Zoom, but we, we're not looking behind, but we're just, we're covering up ourselves with slides with too many words. And my thought is, well, they're reading the slide. Why don't they just send the slides? We don't need you. We can read the slides ourselves. <laughs> so, so I'd had the journey of, depending on the slides, then I would take half sheets of paper, I'd cut regular paper in half, and I'd put big words on them, and I'd put them on the floor in, in front of me so, so that I could see what my cues were. So, you know, I just, once I got rid of the crutch, and let me tell you what it was, I had to follow Les Brown twice. Oh, stage. wow. And so I, I, I wore my tails. I was so was the conductor, know about leadership. So I'm getting dressed, tie my bow tie, and I look in the mirror, and I'm nervous as I'll get out because he had the crowd, the crowd roaring. And I said, looked at myself and said, "You're going to go out there, and you're going to be Hugh Blue." And so I claimed then I had no script. I knew where I was going. I had some slides, but they were enhancements. So what is the secret to? And my my clergy my clergy family member said. He doesn't read the script and people tell him they can feel the difference. So what that's is exactly your, it. Your secret? What is your secret? Feeling the difference is a big thing because you want them to get in sight, sound, taste, you want to have the experience. So I, I did away with all that as well. I've gone through the gamut of hard script, no script. Um, I went with keywords. So I would use limited PowerPoints. Um, and again, if you're doing virtual, do away with PowerPoints. Uh, I, I just was on a uh, coaching event back in Minnesota with a church ministry group. We were preparing for it a month in advance. And he said, I got 130 slides. We're going to crank through these. And I said, no, you don't have 130 slides. He goes, yeah, I do. I said, no, you don't have 130 slides. He said, what do you mean? I said, you have half of 130 slides, but you are not going to use that. So he listened to my coaching of you are the star, not the slides. Um, I actually lived in Rochester, Minnesota, the home of IBM. And IBM would click you to death with one slide after another. I said, you're not gonna click your people to death. You need to be the star. So we, we got there, we're preparing for this event and he still had way too many slides. The partner he was gonna co-chair this event live on camera with said, Trigger, help him out. I said, okay, you need to cut half of them again. And he goes, no, you're killing me. I said, you need to cut half of them again. We will not be using half of those slides. So he spent the night before the show cutting down half again and blowing up the fonts. 
so they would be usable better for shorter, quick tea. We got done and they said, thank you, you saved us. We would have been clicking and so focused on the right order, the right process, and we would have missed a slide. It would have been a train wreck. So my tip is either do keywords, but I invest in post-it notes. This is the best gift I can give you. Get a bunch of post-it notes, put them on your video monitor right in front of you, and put your keywords right in front. You, it will force you to look at the camera because you want to engage with the camera. Eye camera level is so important. Where you put your camera, not to the side, not down, not looking up. If you put your post-it notes right here, you will look at that. No one will ever see them and number the post-it notes because we've all done this. Every one of us has had talking points and we forget the order of the talking points. And there's nothing worse than having a train wreck happen when you don't remember the order and a message. So put a one, put a two, put them on your screen. But now I'm talking to you. I have the freedom to do different stories. I have freedoms, again, in, in the church setting, let God, let the spirit work through you and not be stuck to a script. I did this for years in the church that I planted and I found more freedom by letting it go that direction I would have the same message, the same main scripture, the same outline, but it would always flow much freer for me. And people could tell, like you said, they can tell when you're reading, they can tell when you're stuck, and they can tell when it's just oozing out of you. So I, I, I always coach what I call saturation. I would prepare all week long so it would saturate and ooze out of me come Sunday, come Thursday. I would have it at the point where it just naturally flowed out of me on the virtual stage. You can learn tricks like that, that now it just oozes out of you and people will love it. They will feel it and they will want to keep going to the very end with you. So people use a script because they're afraid of leaving something out. How do you handle that? I tell them, don't worry about it. It wasn't that important. Um, we overthink things at some point where we think everything is so darn important. I am a believer of in the moment, we're gonna know what the crowd really needs. You may sit on one point longer. You know, we might sit on, let's just say, and um, entertainment longer because we know the crowd here needs more entertainment. The next crowd, it might be the engagement side. It could be the energy. We get the sense by the polls, by the questions, by the feedback, by the spirit of where we need to go. So I tell people, don't worry if you missed it. Part of the reason we do Q and A's, you can go back and pick it up in Q A's. Also, in your engagement, in your presentation, always leave them wanting more. Always leave them wanting to either call you, email you, follow up, dangle a cliffhanger. Again, this is TV. Cliffhangers have worked in movies and TV for years and years. So if you miss it, at the end, drop in. Oh, by the way, there were two more points I could have got to today. But if you want to learn about those, reach out. I'd love to talk with you and just leave it as a cliffhanger. You now have another engagement. And you know, a surprise at the end that grabs people and they want to come back for more. Love it. Love it. Love it. So we got energy, engagement, entertainment, drum roll number four. Environment. This is the big one. Again, I do virtual environments. You can do the physical environment or the virtual environment. I feel that I'm on stage by doing virtual. I feel that I actually uh, on a platform again, uh, not in an office, not in a makeshift studio. We're all doing this from makeshift studios at home in our basements. We're converting, uh, converting bedrooms. Uh, whatever it is we're doing, we're now creating a new space for doing this. But the environment now tells me lights, camera, action. And now it brings that persona, that energy, the engagement. It helps me to really feel I'm in a different place. I can see myself on camera. I can see myself even though I'm looking at the camera. That's a whole other trick of media. Look at the camera. Be aware of what you're doing on camera. Because your environment now allows you to move in, move back. Uh, you also don't want to have the silly halo that all the Zoom stuff gets. Um, the digital screen of Zoom without a green screen will always give you the halo effect. You'll always get ghosted. When, when people are talking, you see the arm disappear. It loses everybody. It's a real distraction. A physical green screen allows me to have a more deeper, richer environment. And now I'm not ghosting. I'm not doing anything. I'm just confidently presenting. 
Now, if you do a physical set, I encourage you to do it in a corner of a room so you have depth to it. Don't, don't just do it on a flat surface because that just feels one dimensional. Do it where you have a corner, where you have things on the side, things behind, and just in different angles. It also helps your audio sound because now you have, instead of a flat surface bouncing things off you, you know about this, you don't want that hard surface to bounce off the audio. The angles help cut and bounce and it's a richer sound. So your environment is so important. And, you know, I noticed you had your hair done nicely for the show today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, when you have hair and you're on those virtual things, your hair will have a matte look to it. It automatically squeezes in. Um, I, I've, I've seen very attractive, lovely ladies. They do their hair great for being on camera. And it's like, whoop, um, it's not a good thing. So this environment thing is bigger than what you think. Plus now, if you have a company, if you have a church ministry, if you have your non-private agency, having a good environment brings confidence to the people watching. People well, are shaken by COVID. People are freaked out by COVID. They've lost confidence. This gives confidence, non-verbal confidence again, of they're really doing a great job. These people are really trustworthy. They're put together, and it gives credibility to what you're doing virtually. Instead of saying, this is lesser than, it makes it greater than again. That's a great tip. And I was also thinking about um, sometimes we want to be too fancy with too many colors, too many patterns, which I think is, is also just, I noticed you have a solid color and I'm mostly solid with a little bit of check. So it was really, you don't want too much distraction anywhere. No, simple is better. Uh, you also need to be aware if you're doing a green screen, you cannot wear green clothes. You will do what Hollywood does and you will disappear and you'll have the floating head on camera. You cannot wear green with a green screen. You cannot wear blue with a blue screen. The same thing will happen. Also, I have found the darker colors, the richer color also help hide the illusion of the ghosting. If you do a lot of whites, if you see most of those white, very clear, crisp backdrops, you're always going to get the outline. You always get that dark cartoony line around you. So I encourage dark blues, dark greens, whatever it is you're going to go with, go with a darker, richer color. It adds to the depth and you're back on stage again. So these are just some of the tricks. Also, lighting does matter. Uh, you want good lighting to hit it. This is technology now, but the lighting helps hit it, absorb it, and then it blends in better. So those are some of the other things you need to start thinking about with your virtual backgrounds or physical background. How are you lighting it so it looks authentic? I'm traveling today, so I don't have my studio lights. I don't have the diffusers. and the angle of the light and the softness. I notice your face is very soft. Uh, people will be looking, uh, listening to this on a podcast. So when I complimented uh, Rich, Rich's hair, it's because there's no hair on the top of his head. It's on the front of his face. <laughs> but, but, and so he's wearing a, a single collar and he's got a background that is at an angle. So it, it has some depth to it. So you pretty much practice what you, what you preach here. And, and so um, we can be distracting to our message in a number of ways. So parents, with parents and lighting. And so I'm, I'm not with my TV glasses today because I have glasses with an anti-glare. But I noticed when I looked at myself, there's a glare. And then looking at the camera, and many of us have separate cameras now. And the camera is one place and the monitor is another. And I have some people I talk to and the monitor is on the side so they're talking with facing the side and I'm seeing the side of their head. So looking into the camera is key, isn't it? Well, yes, you have to talk eyeball to eyeball. I talk to the camera. The camera is the person. The camera is not technology. This is Hugh. Or if I was on a group, this would be the audience. And I talk to the camera. I, I play to the camera. And that's why actors have learned to fall in love with the camera. Uh, I, I was on a call before we went live here today with a gal who's been in TV, who her whole family has been around TV production. We had a great conversation about the importance of play to the camera. And that means you need to have your technology in front. If you have a separate monitor to the side, I highly recommend moving it, stacking them, putting them in front of you. No one cares what's on the other side of the camera. No one cares what's on the other side of what I'm looking at right now. Pile it up, make it work for it, but keep all attention here. But if you go this direction and try talking to somebody, You've lost them. Um, or if you have that bad lighting, you have that 
two-faced look, the dark and the light, and people think you're in the shadow, you're in the light, and also the glare things. Hollywood has, has worked on that glare technique for years and years and years. Glasses and camera angles and lighting angles are really important. So if you do wear contacts, glasses, you need to run video on yourself so your environment does not have that repulsive glare. You want to make sure it's as clean as you can get it. Roll tape, practice, roll tape, practice. And then I also mark them on the floor. I also know exactly where my camera is going to be. I know where my tripods are going to be for my lighting. And your studio becomes more of a fixed studio. And it really helps you out to create that full environment. And then you get the full confidence. Love it. Love it. Because um, even though you said 70% of our impact is the emotion, the presence, the, the energy in the room, 7% is the words. And so the words have to be important. So we have energy, engagement, entertainment, environment. And number five is? Uh, education. Now we're actually the one that people want to get to. People are all about, I want to educate. I want to teach. I, I, I want to transform people through the message of the gospel, whatever, or your nonprofit agency. We're trying to help the homeless, whatever, you know, thing we're trying to do. People want to get there. And I really stress, you have to do the first four now. We, we really don't have a choice. And I, and I know that sounds kind of strong and arrogant. You can't do this without the first four on the virtual stage. And the virtual stage is here to stay. No matter what happens post COVID, this is now working, it's operating, it's flourishing, and it's gonna be expanding. So we need to learn to work with this and use it for the greater good of our messages. So education now is all those things put together, now give them something compelling. You know, salespeople are having a hard time selling because they're not doing these things. People have lost consumer confidence. They've, they've lost confidence in the companies. So they're trying to educate, they're trying to sell. They don't know how to go to the clothes on camera. They don't know how to share documents on, on the technology side. So now education is what we need to really figure out. How do you educate people? How do you do this in a way that's gonna make people much more engaging and energized and passionate? So now your education can all be much more free flowing. And again, I, I, I don't encourage you to use PowerPoints. I encourage you to use the storytelling use testimonials. Here's a great way to do education. If you're the main speaker, bring someone else in, invite them and have them ready to go and invite them onto the Zoom somewhere in this and interview them. Ask them to share a testimony. People love hearing a satisfied customer is always better than the salesman. <laughs> Whatever the product is, people want to hear from the satisfied real customer. Hey, Susie wants to tell you about the great thing that happened this week when we were packing shoe boxes for kids overseas. Susie, Tell us all about it. And Susie just lights up. She goes crazy. It's energy, it's passion, it's testimony, and it's education about here's what we did, here's what we accomplished, and now you're educating and it supports everything that you are trying to share as a message. And it was entertainment. Because Susie is like a new commercial. So it's all these things brought together, but you're educating people in a new, creative, fun way. And, and we learn more that way. So talk about length. You talked about time between commercials earlier on about being seven minutes, but um, we don't pay attention very for very long at a time. So um, length of the total presentation and then how do you segment it so it's broken into palatable, executable sections? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll use my How to Rock the Virtual Stage show just as an example. Again, I come out of radio. We used to clock everything. You know, you have the traffic at the the 40s and the 20s, and that's always pretty standard. So you start doing the same thing here now. So I'll, I'll do my introduction. I'll tease the next week's show. So that's a little teaser. Then I'll talk about uh, the new guests coming on up. Then I'll bring the guests on in, and we'll start going. And around 10, 12 after, I'll intentionally launch a poll. I'll have some preset polls pre-programmed. I'll launch poll number one. I'll then ask the question of the crowd, share the questionnaire. I'll go back to my guest. We'll start talking about other things. And I'll say, oh, let's go back to our poll and see what the results are. Then I share the results. That's another commercial. Then we come out of that and we keep going again. So it's every seven to 10 minutes, I intentionally am changing something else. At the half hour, I do, I do another poll. And at that point, I have the guests ask, uh, answer a long question. And I bring everyone in. And everyone moves from the webinar mode into panel mode. Now everyone comes in and they can all interact as a live studio audience. And now I started saying, 
If you have a question for Hugh today, Hugh's going to answer your questions, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask a quick question. Well, then we have all this transition between them speaking, me speaking, Hugh speaking, and the engagement and the time just zooms by. And then I do a wrap up very much the same and then we're out of it. And I really encourage people, if you're going to do something like this, half hour shows are great. Our shows work really well. Nothing more than an hour and a half. People cannot do three hour Zooms. People cannot do two hour Zooms. Board meetings, you cannot do them long anymore. I encourage you to think about TV episodes. Do a part one and come back Tuesday night for part two of our board meeting. People will be more refreshed, more energized. They'll have time to think about ideas, give them a homework assignment to go do, and they'll come back and say, all right, let's knock it out for another hour. Um, when, when I was doing live presentations with my training for my leaders at my church, I can get pumped out. I can get jacked up. I can go, the longer the meeting goes, I get more excited, Hugh. I made a promise. I'd go an hour and a half, put a note in front of me, and just when they were getting tired, I would stop and say, okay, I could go further. But we're going to stop because I promised you an hour and a half max. Let's pick it up next week, next month. And they thanked me for the self-awareness and not dragging them beyond where they can go. We have to be aware of where people are at and figure out what the clock looks like. What's your goal for the uh, show, for the event, for the webinar? What's your goal for that? And then tying these things out so the engagement and the length does not draw out too long. Well, and for those of us, so there's many applications for what you're teaching us. I have online content and I've switched from hour modules to five minute modules. And it's a five minute with a handout, you know, an action guide. So here's a concept, here's what you can do about it. So some people just wanna gather data. And to me, that's not useful. Let's, let's learn it, let's digest it and let, let's apply it. Yeah. So breaking it into smaller, I think we're, we're better at taking the information, because I don't know about you, but I, I'd like people to use what I share with them. Well, yeah, and like the five minute model is a great one. If you're doing quick educational, so like these, these five points I gave you today, you could have five different modules. I can just do energy and then have a handout, have a, a, a product. I could do the engagement, do the same thing. I could have five different subparts with an introduction and a closer. So I could have seven modules now for good content and people can learn at their own pace, five minutes, seven minutes, roughly, those are nuggets. Again, sound by culture. How can we do it quick, informative, fun, engaging, and have them come back for more? So I got three Ps for you. Behind these five E's, there's three Ps. Prepare, yep. pra practice, and preview. I mean, how many times have people been up on stage and they show a slide that's got a glaring spelling error because they didn't preview it? How many times do you know they're winging it because they haven't rehearsed it as they're depending on it? And, and you know, they didn't really think through what they were saying. So the message is sort of halfway there. You want to comment on those three or do you want to add? Yeah. No, no, no. Actually, those are great because you do need to prepare. Again, I, I, I talk about show running. I'm now show running a show every Wednesday night. You are show running the show here every week. You have to send out preview content. Here's the questions, here's the outline. If you are new to this, which mostly everyone is, I encourage you to stand, stand up, roll tape on yourself. The best way you're gonna learn about presentation is a roll and review, roll and review, and then edit and drop review. Um, in my earliest days of broadcasting, this goes back way back to splicing tape. Remember that, you? Oh, yes. Splicing audio tape. I would listen to myself, and the hardest thing for a speaker is, is to learn what your head sound, your head voice sounds like to the real crowd. Our, our voice in our head is different than crowd voice. We had to listen back to our audio, and it was like, oh, it was painful. I was horrible. And I had to get used to hearing my own voice. But the more I did it, the more I learned about how to use the voice, just like learning an instrument. The more I heard myself, the better I got at it. Then I learned how to be a storyteller, the highs, the lows, the voice inflection, the stage mannerisms. We now have a way to do that. We, we used to stand up in front of mirrors and look at ourselves. Now, now just roll the tape, turn on the microphone and let it go. Delete it, trash can. No one will ever know how bad you once were 
unless you want to share it at a gag party someday. But that's preparation. This is all about now, how can we do this better? Coming down to our last five, six minutes here. So I got two. I'm going to put these two questions together and let you uh, address them. Uh, the virtual stage is an ever expanding platform with limitless potential to impact the world. So that's the first one. The second one, how do you see this virtual stage impacting all of us who are presenters after COVID is over? Well, first of all, the co uh, after COVID, the virtual stage is not going away. I've already talked to event planners. I've also talked to many speakers. They really realize, look, there's no hotels. There's no bad food. There's no TSA. There's no delays in anything. This has opened up. I have been in Australia and in Canada on the very same day. It's impossible to do that in the physical world. There are more platforms available now this way. It used to be the big arenas, but only have the big speakers, whether it's a Christian convention, a Tony Robbins convention, a John Maxwell. The A-list people always got the front and center of the main stage. You got regulated to the kids' table, the, 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 the smaller event box. Now, everyone is coming from the same place. They may still have John come in live and do a John Maxwell live, but they want, they'll beam you in separately and you'll be just as strong, just as polished if you know how to do this. They can have you do a breakout seminar and you can have a virtual breakout. So there's gonna be more platforms. Also, small hotels that have never been able to compete with the big auditoriums, small hotels can now say, we're gonna do an event. We're gonna have a local person come in live and do this. And then we're gonna have three other people beam in and you can have a four person speaker event in a small hotel that suits 200 people. And they finally get a chance to compete and be a part of it. There are more stages that are gonna come alive than ever before. The, the, uh, the other thing with this is there, there are gonna be these TV shows like I run, the evolution of this is gonna get bigger and bigger. We're already seeing this with Netflix. We're already seeing this with HBO Max. We are seeing the evolution of broadcast TV as we knew it is now fractured and the outreach platforms are unbelievably rich and big. So as for churches, for example, you can now do, and, and, I, and I can remember televangelists, and I can remember how horrible in some of the debates and some of the tragedies of televangelists, but now we have a tool that we can beam in the people and share with them in a powerful new way. The shut-ins, the people that are medically stuck at home forever, even after COVID, you now have a ministry tool that can, you can reach in and talk to in a way like never, ever before. This is endless. This is ever expanding. I really believe it. And I don't think we're ever going to shut this down. I think there's going to be a whole new evolution. There's going to be a whole new stream of virtual activity that is going to be great. It can be used for good. It can be used for bad. We all know that. But I believe there's more good that can be done here. And I really encourage people to step up and really rock it. So we've got about two minutes here. So um, it, it, it occurs to me, and I've always said this to to, to leaders. Leaders are presenters. And you can do the very same thing you're talking about here for a crowd when you're presenting to one funder or one potential board member. I think the same rules apply. What do you say to that? Absolutely. And I, and I think they have to. I think, again, I, I'll, I, I go back to Walt Disney. Walt Disney is the wonderful world of Disney every Sunday night. Disney yeah. would come out behind his desk, do 15 minutes of talking about the maps, the toys, the, the new things. He would vision cast and ooze out how cool this would be. And then he would say, and now here's our feature presentation. If you look back, Walt was better most of the time in 15 minutes than most of his features were. He was so captivating, so education that that's what drove Disney to grow. It was the vision, his way of communicating and coming alive. He was doing virtual stage before any of us. That's what we need today for leaders, pastors, business people we need to have new walt disney's yeah he was pushing the curve wasn't he but he made it interesting and it was entertaining and it was engaging it was energized i mean he had a very distinctive presentation style but he rehearsed it and it was it was very well prepared so um rich this is very helpful we talked um a lot about faith-based ministry work but it's the same in the 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 testimonies we give for our, our charitable organizations doing good work because we need to connect with people more than we are or we have been. So this is a really good opportunity to connect with different audiences to talk about the charitable work we're doing. 
because there's so many charities doing really great things and there's a lot of people that don't know about it. So you've opened a new door to a whole new platform for lots of nonprofits. Well, let me just tack on there for a second. Do a shout out, do a Facebook Live, do something and show them in action. Here's what we're about, but do it again in a big stage engaging way. You will pull people. They will come running at you with your nonprofits. So there's the there's always the teacher piece that says in anything you're doing, don't have too many points. And then tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And then I add to that, now challenge them to go do something. So I'm going to do a commercial moment and I'm going to come back and have you challenge people to do something, if you will. So our sponsor is EZ Card, the letter E, the letter Z, and it's a virtual card. You can have center vision everything we do in the palm of your hand on your smartphone. It's not an app, nothing to download. So write this down. Send a text to this number, five digits, 64600, 64600. It'll look funny, put it in the number and in the message, put in the letters L D. R. It's a very truncated leader, LDR, 64600. Text the message LDR, you'll get a return text. Click on that and you'll have the app, the easy virtual card for Center Vision Leadership, Leadership Foundation. One of the tabs is the videos for the nonprofit exchange. You can see seven years of these. We've never had one like trigger trigger today you pulled the trigger on a lot of things so what do you want to challenge people with as we leave this really helpful interview yeah the biggest thing is the technology and the virtual stage is not your enemy and you have not lost anything in fact you've gained a new tool that i think is going to help and enrich us in so many ways but you do have to learn broadcast skills be a constant learner be someone that's taking looking absorbing and practicing there's nothing to fear. And, and, and if you need help with this, reach out. This is what I do for a living now. I'm having the time of my life helping agencies, people, presenters, nonprofit churches. I'm helping people actually up their game because this is here the stage. And this is going to be a major impact, a game changer. And I would love to help you achieve your dreams and goals. So go have fun with this. Just go have fun. And on the, uh, on the podcast platform and on the page on the website, the nonprofit exchange.org. There's richbontrigger.net and there's a contact form in your web website. You can see some videos and some helpful stuff on Rich Bontrigger. It's B O N T R A G E R, richbontrigger.com. So Rich Trigger Bontrager, thank you for a helpful, wonderful interview today. Great to be with you, Hugh. Thanks very much for letting me help you rock the stage. Well, you rocked my stage today, so thank you so much.